Last week we entered this strange, unfamiliar land of what is referred to as apocalyptic literature. The second half of Daniel, beginning with chapter 7, consists of these apocalyptic visions which were given to God's people through Daniel in order to help them and us persevere through suffering and evil while maintaining our faith and trust in God. This week, we are going to look at Daniel's second vision, the vision of the ram, the goat, and the little horn found in Daniel 8. And we're going to begin by first seeing the setting and the time frame in which this vision was given to him. So we'll start with verses 1 and 2 from Daniel 8. Look there with me in your Bible. Verses 1 and 2. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, after that which appeared to me at the first. And I saw in the vision, and when I saw, I was in Susa, the citadel, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in the vision, and I was at the Uli Canal. We learn that Daniel received this second vision once again during the reign of King Belshazzar. He received this vision while Babylon was still ruling as the dominant empire on the stage of the known world. So take a mental note of that, stick it in your mental shirt pocket, because that's going to become important as we go along to see that Babylon is ruling the world. So we have the time frame, but we also see where Daniel is transported to, not physically, but visually, in the vision. In this vision, he finds himself in Susa, a city in which would eventually become one of the royal cities of the Persian Empire. And he's standing there at the Uli Canal. It's really close to the city. It's on the northwest side. He's standing there. He's been taken there in the vision, and God's about to unfold something for him. And that's what we see take place in the next few verses. It begins with an image of a ram in verses 3 and 4. Look there with me. Daniel writes, I raised my eyes and saw... And behold, a ram standing on the bank of the canal. It had two horns, and both horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. I saw the ram charging westward and northward and southward. No beast could stand before him, and there was no one who could rescue from his power. He did as he pleased and became great." Once again, similar to what we saw in Daniel 7, this vision consists of animal imagery. But this time it appears that the animals are somewhat normal. We saw these monstrous, grotesque things in Daniel 7. Here we see a normal image of an animal, image of a ram standing on the bank of the canal. And we find more similarities with the previous vision and its emphasis on the horns of the creatures. Here we learn that this ram has two horns, And both horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. He's giving specifics about the direction in which this beast is going. He concludes with this description of the ram by stressing its power. No beast could stand before this ram. No other beast could rescue from this ram, and it became great. It's then that the focus of the vision switches to yet another beast, this time a goat. Look at verses 5 through 8 with me. As I was considering, behold, a male goat came from the west across the face of the whole earth without touching the ground. And the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. He came to the ram with the two horns, which I'd seen standing on the bank of the canal. And he ran at him in his powerful wrath. I saw him come close to the ram, and he was enraged against him and struck the ram and broke its two horns. And the ram had no power to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled on him. And there was no one who could rescue the ram from his power. Then the goat became exceedingly great, but when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and instead of it there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. Here in verses 5 through 8, Daniel reports of seeing this 
This image of a shaggy goat, literally a shaggy goat. Some of your translations may say that. And he's coming from the west, and we see the speed of this creature emphasized. He's coming across the face of the earth without touching the ground. So once again, we also see language about horns. We see this very visible, prominent, eye-catching horn between the eyes of the goat. And in his powerful wrath, in his anger, he strikes this ram. And when he does, he breaks the ram's two horns. He casts it to the ground. He tramples it to death. And just like the previous beast, we learn something important, something that's going to continue to build up and escalate and get emphasized throughout the vision. This beast also became exceedingly great. Its power at the time is unmatched. You cannot rescue from this beast. No other beast can rescue the goat from it, from the conspicuous horn. And then something striking takes place in the vision. This, this prominent, visible horn, when it's strong, just like that, it's broken. And in its place arise four other horns. Maybe some things are starting to click together from our time in last week's vision with the numbers and the symbols here. Well, it's then that the focus of Daniel's vision shifts once more. This time, not onto another creature, but onto one of these four horns of this goat. Look at verses 9 through 12 with me. Out of one of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. It grew great even to the host of heaven. And some of the host and some of the stars it threw down to the ground and trampled on them. It became great, even as great as the prince of the host. And the regular burnt offering was taken from him. And the place of his sanctuary was overthrown. And a host will be given over to it together with the regular burnt offering because of transgression or rebellion. And it will throw truth to the ground and it will act and prosper. We reach the climax of this vision that Daniel is having with the arrival of this little horn that rises from one of the four horns of the goat. Everything in this vision is building up to the arrival of this little horn. And just as the creatures described before it, we see this little horn grew exceedingly great. From the vision, it seems clear that this little horn far surpasses the previous kings in terms of his greatness, his violence, and hatred. But what is most striking about the activity of this little horn is not so much his conquests, like that of the ram and the goat and its first horn. The hateful, malicious activity of this little horn seems to be directed in a particular place and against a particular group. This vision reveals that it grew great toward the glorious land, that it threw down the hosts of heaven, that it grew as great as the prince of the host. We see how this little horn violently throws down and tramples some of the hosts, some of the stars of heaven. He overthrows the sanctuary. Think about that word. He, over, he gets rid of, takes away the burnt offerings. We see how some of the hosts will be given over into the power of this little horn. He'll despise truth. He will do whatever he pleases. Note that the activity of this little horn, it's filled with religious language. That is to say, it's filled with language that reveals him being opposed to religion, what seems to be the religious actions associated with heaven itself. We see the language of hostility, persecution, oppression, and violence. It is truly a dreadful image an image which prompts a question to be asked in the vision. We see one angel in the vision ask another angel a question in verses 13 through 14. There we read, Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the one who spoke, For how long is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering, the transgression that makes desolate, and the giving over of the sanctuary and host to be trampled underfoot? And he said to me, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary shall be restored 
to its rightful state. It is a question that was familiar to God's people, one we read throughout the Psalms, a question we are also familiar with, one that we ask ourselves in trials and seasons of suffering. The question is, how long? How long? How long will this little horn carry out this agenda of violence and persecution and oppression? In other words, when will the suffering end? When will the suffering end? And it is the answer to that question that brings the vision to a close. The activity of this little horn will go on for 2,300 evenings and mornings. And after that, the sanctuary, which was overthrown by the little horn, it will be restored to its rightful state. Well, once again, we find ourselves at the end of this very detailed, very graphic, very strange vision, wondering what to make of it. Of course, Daniel found himself in a similar position. He cannot understand this vision unless someone interprets it for him, and that's exactly what we see take place throughout the rest of chapter 8. In verses 19, or excuse me, 15 through 19, Daniel meets his interpreter in the vision, and he begins learning what these things mean. Look at verses 15 through 19 with me. When I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. And behold, there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli Canal, and it called, Gabriel. Make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood. And when he came, I was frightened and fell on my face. But he said to me, Understand, O son of man, that the vision is for the time of the end. And when he had spoken to me, I fell into a deep sleep with my face, excuse me, to the ground. But he touched me and made me stand up. He said, Behold, I will make known to you what shall be at the latter end of the indignation of the wrath, for it refers to the appointed time of the end. Here in these verses, we are introduced to the interpreter. His name is Gabriel. Daniel hears a man's voice, in all likelihood the voice of God, calling for Gabriel, this one standing before Daniel, to interpret the vision for him, to teach him, to explain to him. And based on Daniel's reaction, when Gabriel approaches him, we get the idea that this was not merely a man, though he had the appearance of one. Daniel is completely overcome with fear and awe, and he falls on his face before him. Well, who is he? Who is Gabriel? And why is Daniel so overcome with fear at the sight of him? We learn by inference here and by explicit teaching later in Daniel as well as the New Testament that Gabriel is an angel. In one of his appearances in the New Testament in Luke chapter 1, he describes himself as one who stands in the presence of God, as one sent forth from God. We also learn in Luke 1 that when Gabriel appeared to Zechariah, John the Baptist's father, Zechariah fell down in fear before him. We see that frequently in Scripture when humans encounter angelic beings. These glorious, majestic, heavenly beings initially strike fear into the hearts of those whom they encounter. So get that vision out of your head of the little naked babies with wings. Like, that's not it. No one's afraid of that. But these glorious creatures strike fear into those who see them, and they fall on their faces before them. But, as we see here in Daniel 8, though majestic, though awe-inspiring, angels are God's messengers, God's servants. Gabriel doesn't leave Daniel laying in the ground, on the ground, in fear. He begins to explain the vision, and he tells Daniel that the vision is for the time of the end. And in this context, the context of Daniel 8, the time of the end refers not to the end of the age, but to the end of the events of this vision. 
In other words, the interpretation of this vision runs to the end of the events recorded in the vision, the end of the 2,300 evenings and mornings during which this little horn will wreak havoc and do as he pleases. So after causing Daniel to get back up on his feet, Gabriel begins to interpret the vision for him. And what follows is a fairly straightforward interpretation of the beasts and the little horn. First, Gabriel reveals the identity of the ram in verse 20. There he says, As for the ram that you saw with two horns, these are the kings of Media and Persia. You should know something about these kings by now through our, our time in Daniel. This ram corresponds with that second beast of Daniel 7. That second section of the great image of Daniel 3. It's the same empire that will conquer Babylon at the end of chapter 5. And just like we see the strength and power of Persia emphasized over media in the bear-like creature of Daniel 7. Remember, the bear was raised up on one side. We see the same thing here in chapter 8. The two horns of the ram represent the kings of this combined empire, and the vision reveals how one of the horns was bigger than the other one. Persia was the dominant one of the combined empire, and it is depicted as such by this bigger horn in the vision. Then Gabriel goes on to reveal the identity of the goat in verses 21 and 22. There we read, And the goat is the king of Greece. And the great horn between his eyes is the first king. As for the horn that was broken, in place of which four others arose, four kingdoms shall arise from his nation, but not with his power. The goat in the vision of Daniel 8 corresponds with that third beast we saw last week in Daniel 7, the third section of that great image of Daniel 2. Not Daniel 3, I said Daniel 3 last time. Daniel 2. It represents the Greek empire. We learn from Daniel 8, chapters 2 and 7, and secular history, the Greek empire conquered the Medo-Persian empire. And they did it with unbelievable speed. Remember in the vision, the goat, it's coming across from the west, across the face of the earth. It's moving so fast, its feet are barely touching the ground. You remember reading that in the vision. We also see the great horn between the goat's eyes. Remember the conspicuous horn? He's identified as the first king. Well, we learned who that was last week. We learned who that was in 10th grade world history class. Alexander the Great, the young Greek commander. He conquered the entire known world by the time he was 30 years old. Incredible. Just like, remember the speed was emphasized? He was the leopard with the four wings. Here, he's this goat that's running so fast, he's not even touching the ground. 30 years old, he's the ruler of the world, literally. But just after his conquest of the known world, at the young age of 32, Alexander the Great died. The conspicuous horn between the eyes of the goat was broken, just like the vision said. And his kingdom was subsequently divided into four smaller kingdoms by his general. Hence, the four horns that grow up in the place of the conspicuous broken horn. So we have the identities of the ram and the goat, the kingdoms and kings they represent. But what of the figure who dominates the focus of the vision? This exceedingly great little horn. Gabriel reveals its identity in verses 23 through 25. There we read, At the latter end of their kingdom, these, these four kingdoms that arise out of Greece, when the transgressors have reached their limit, a king of bold face who understands riddles shall arise. His power shall be great, but not by his own power. And he shall cause fearful destruction and shall succeed in what he does and destroy mighty men and the people who are the saints. By his cunning, he shall make deceit prosper under his hand and in his own mind, he shall become great. Without warning, he shall destroy many and he shall even rise up against the prince of princes and he shall be broken, but by no human 
hand. The interpretation Gabriel gives to Daniel reveals that from one of these four horns of the goat, that is, from one of the four kingdoms that arise after Alexander the Great's death, there will come a wicked king who will do unspeakably evil things. This little horn who casts down and tramples the hosts of heaven and overthrows the sanctuary and cuts off the regular burnt offerings is identified as a king who will come in great power, but not in his own power. No, based on the actions of this text, I think it's safe to say that he comes in the power of the evil one, that he comes in the power of Satan, and he will destroy and kill God's saints, God's people. He will even exalt himself against the prince of princes. That is to say, he will exalt himself against the most high God, the God who is exalted above all other so-called gods. So Daniel identifies him as a bold-faced king from one of the four divisions of the latter-end Greek empire, and he gives us the specific actions of the king. But he doesn't give us his name. However, both secular and religious historical writings from the time period of the vision's fulfillment tell us exactly who this king was and exactly what he did. Teachers, commentators are virtually unanimous in identifying this king, this little horn from Daniel 8. It's a man by the name of Antiochus IV Epiphanes. That's a weird name. It means God manifest. Teaches you a lot about what he thinks of himself. Antiochus the Fourth Epiphanes. And again, this, I'm not a history teacher, so I don't mean to. My sermons put enough people to sleep, so I don't. I know a history lesson will. That's we're going to get to the bigger picture, but this is important for you to see because you're going to see the power of God and how all of this comes together. The Seleucid Empire was one of the four kingdoms which came from the division of the Greek Empire after Alexander the Great's death. Seleucid Empire, they're one of these four horns. There arose over that empire in 175 BC a king who worked his way to the throne through bribery and deceit. He wasn't the rightful heir of that throne. That king was Antiochus IV. He was a wicked man. His reputation was that of an arrogant, conniving, conceited individual. But as the text reveals and history verifies, Antiochus, fourth Epiphanes, had a particular agenda. The vision revealed that this king grew in power toward the south, toward the east, and toward the beautiful land. What's the beautiful land? What land would Daniel, a faithful Hebrew, designate as the beautiful land? It's the land of Palestine. It's the land where God's people dwelt in the Old Testament, the place where God's temple was in Jerusalem. And while at the time in which Daniel received this vision, the Jews from Judah, they were living in exile in Babylon, the vision points forward to a time after their deliverance from exile, to the time of their return to Jerusalem, to rebuild the temple, to their return to the beautiful land, land that would eventually be ruled over by Antiochus IV in the second century B.C., but for this wicked ruler who comes in the power of the evil one, ruling over that land, it was not enough. We know from both scripture and history that the seed of the serpent wages war against the seed of the woman. The seed of Satan wages war against the seed of God. We see that played out in the actions of this wicked king. It all started when he assassinated the Jewish high priest in 170 BC. He persecuted and murdered thousands of Jewish people who refused to comply with his unjust policies. Men, women, children, infants, he slaughtered them. At one point, he attacked Jerusalem, pillaged the temple, and murdered 80,000 people. But then in December of 167 BC, Antiochus IV reached the climax of his persecution of God's people and his opposition of the one true and living God when he set up an altar to the Greek god Zeus in the temple in Jerusalem. He had already cut off the Jews' burnt offerings. They were no longer allowed to offer offerings to their god. 
but he set up an altar to his false god and sacrificed pigs to it. This was quite literally an abominable act. It was blasphemy against the Most High God, a direct assault on his holiness and his law. Antiochus IV was worshiping an idol by sacrificing unclean animals to it in the very place that the one true and living God made his presence known among his people. He profaned God's holy temple. He profaned God's law. He commanded God's people to disobey God's law. He commanded God's people to devote themselves to the false gods of the Greek empire. He zealously persecuted and murdered God's people. And in all of these ways, this king, this little horn, destroyed mighty men and the saints of God and even rose up against the prince of princes, God himself. And then after focusing on all the destruction that Antiochus IV will cause, the interpretation of Daniel's vision gives only half a sentence to discussing the end of his oppressive rule over God's people. Gabriel reveals that he shall be broken, but by no human hand. Stop. We learn from history, as well as Jewish religious writings at the time, that the Jews ended this by starting a revolt against Antiochus IV under the leadership of a man named Judas Maccabeus. The Jews recaptured their temple and rededicated it on December 14, 164 BC, restoring the temple just as the vision revealed would take place, an act that ended the 2,300 evenings and mornings of persecution and oppression. Do you know the celebration that commemorates that. Hanukkah, that's what Hanukkah is celebrating. This, the ending of the oppression of Antiochus IV and the recapturing of the temple and rededicating it after it was profaned. And Antiochus IV was indeed broken, but by no human hand, just as scripture said. He died suddenly, 163 BC, after the Jews recaptured the temple from his control. He died in one of his palaces. So in Daniel 8, the restoration of the temple and the destruction of this wicked ruler are only given two verses in the entire chapter. The deliverance of God's people and the destruction of this little horn are not the focus of the vision. And naturally, the reader asks, why? Why is such little emphasis given to the destruction of this wicked man? This is different from what we've seen previously in Daniel. Really no elaboration on the deliverance of the people at all. All of that information comes from later history, writings in between the intertestamental period. I think I know why that is, and we're going to come back to that in just a moment to see that. So we come to the end of Daniel 8. We learn from verse 26 that God says the vision is true, And you need to seal it up. You need to preserve it for my people in the coming generations to have. And then we also see in verse 27, Daniel's reaction to the vision and its interpretation. He is sickened. He is appalled by what he's seen. He can't sleep. He doesn't even understand everything, even after the interpretation. And understandably so, because we don't fully comprehend everything from Daniel 8, even though we're looking back upon all of these events as they've been fulfilled. So as we come to the end of Daniel 8, after reflecting on this vision, how it came to pass, our little boring history lesson, obviously the big question that we must ask ourselves is, so what? So what? Why does this matter? What does this vision mean for God's people, both in Daniel's day and in our day? To answer that question, I want to close by simply focusing on two truths that we can draw out of Daniel 8, okay? Two truths. The first truth is this, and it's not new from the book of Daniel. God is sovereign over history, the nations, and the suffering of his people. First truth, God is sovereign over history, the nations, and the suffering of his people. Daniel has been pounding this truth into our brains in every single chapter so far, and Daniel 8 is no exception. One of the ways in which Daniel teaches us this truth in his writing is by using, fancy word here, a divine 
passive. What does that mean as he's writing? He's writing from a God-centered worldview. And when he starts telling us all these things in this vision, and he just breezes by him, he says, I was given a vision. Horn was broken. God's people were given over to a wicked ruler. Temple restored. He's just passively describing all these things. We're not just to understand that these are just coincidentally just happening. No. We are to understand them to mean God gave him the visions. God broke kings. God gave his people over into the power of the wicked rulers in judgment because of their unfaithfulness to him. God restored the temple. God delivered his people. The events of Daniel 8, they didn't merely happen. God is the one governing the affairs of human history, including the rising up and tearing down of kings and their kingdoms. He even governs the suffering of his people. And that sounds controversial, but I promise you, it's good news. Because if God is not sovereign over our suffering, then he doesn't have the power to deliver us from any suffering. He is sovereign over it, and therefore, he can deliver us from it, and he will even set a limit upon it, as we see in Daniel 8. We also see God's sovereignty over history, the nations and the suffering as people put on display here in Daniel 8 through the predictive prophecy that we see here. The events of Daniel 8 depicted in the vision were revealed to Daniel 400 years prior to their occurrence. And they were given with such remarkable accuracy. So much so that many scholars refuse to acknowledge this well-attested 6th century B.C. date of authorship. Why? Because they completely dismiss the supernatural. They say, it is impossible for Daniel to have recorded all of these events. The names, it's the Greek Empire. He just comes out and says, it's Greece. 400 years before all of it transpired. They say, that can't happen. Therefore, he couldn't have writ wrote it in the 6th century B.C. Rather, some guy said he was Daniel and wrote it in the 2nd century B.C. because he already had all the information. He could just write, this is going to happen. This will make God look powerful. But it's so well attested. This was written in the 6th century B.C. This was written during the Babylonian exile. And they're right. It would be impossible for any man to predict such things if there were no living God who revealed them. But there is a God, the one true and living God who has spoken through his prophets and speak to, speaks to us now through his inerrant, infallible, living word, and he is able to reveal things. God displays his sovereignty by declaring the end from the beginning, by accurately making known what has not yet come to pass. That's the first truth. Here's the second truth, and we'll close our time together with this. God prepares his people for suffering and promises their deliverance from it. Second truth, God prepares his people for suffering and promises their deliverance from it. I pointed out earlier how little emphasis is given to the destruction of Antiochus IV and deliverance of God's people in the text. Two verses. I believe that is the case because while God is always sure to point out his power and ability to deliver his people, the primary purpose of Daniel 8 is to prepare them for suffering that they will endure prior to the deliverance. The emphasis in the text is on their suffering, not on their deliverance. In his sovereignty, God warned his people in Daniel's day that the coming generations were going to suffer immensely under this bold-faced, wicked king. In other words, God was communicating to his people that their coming suffering was certain. And his revelation of this coming suffering would have served to prepare them for it so that when it arrived, it was neither a surprise nor a deterrent to the true believer's faith even though many of them probably were surprised by its arrival because of their unbelief and unfaithfulness to God, part of the reason it came upon them in the first place. 
And though it is not emphasized in the text, we do see God's deliverance as well. In order to comfort both those who would suffer for his name's sake, God gives a definitive timeline for the suffering. 2,300 evenings and mornings and promises their deliverance. The temple will be restored and the wicked oppressive ruler will be broken, but by no human hand, which you know means by God's hand. So God prepared his old covenant people, Israel, the original audience of Daniel's writing, for suffering, and he promised their deliverance in this vision. But we still have to ask, what about us? What's the message of Daniel 8 for God's people today? This stuff's already happened. Well, it's the same. God prepares us for suffering by revealing that it is certainly coming. And he comforts us by promising our deliverance, by promising there is a limit put on it. But how does God communicate that message to us today through Daniel 8, through a vision that was given in the 6th century and already BC and already fulfilled? Almost 200 years after the fulfillment of the vision from Daniel 8, the Messiah of Israel, the Savior, the Deliverer of God's people, arrived in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle describes it in Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5, by writing, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons." Jesus came and accomplished the salvation of God's people, our ultimate deliverance from suffering, through his sinless life, through his substitutionary death on the cross, through his glorious resurrection from the dead, through his ascension back to the right hand of the Father, a salvation that he offers to all who will repent and believe this good news, to all who will turn from sin and unbelief and turn to faith in him. This Messiah came. And during his earthly ministry, before he accomplished all of that for God's people, prior to his death and resurrection, this Savior, Jesus, warned his followers in the coming generations concerning the suffering that would also befall them. In what is commonly referred to as the Olivet Discourse, it's found in Matthew 24, the Lord Jesus taught his disciples that the transgression that makes desolate, phrase from Daniel 8, the abomination that makes desolate, Daniel 11, same event, an event that finds its fulfillment in what we read in Antiochus, the forced desecration of the Jewish temple in 2nd century B.C., finds partial fulfillment in the destruction of the temple in 70 A.D. It also points forward to even greater suffering that will come upon God's people at the end of the age, according to Jesus. And this greater suffering will come upon God's people at the hands of someone that we were introduced to last week in Daniel chapter 7. Another figure depicted by a little horn as well. And we know him by the name of the Antichrist. The wickedness of Antiochus IV and his persecution of God's people, as revealed in Daniel 8, serve as a shadow, as a prefiguring, as a type that points forward to the man of lawlessness who, toward the end of the age, will exalt himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God proclaiming himself to be God. Antiochus IV and the harm he brought upon God's people serves to warn us, God's people today, of a future ruler who will be like him but worse. A ruler who will also come in the power of the evil one. A ruler who will also oppose God and bring even more destruction and harm upon those who love and follow the Lord Jesus. Just as God prepared his people for suffering by warning them of the coming of Antiochus IV, God prepares his church for suffering by warning us of the coming 
Antichrist, by warning us of the coming of the man of lawlessness. And contrary to what many Christians believe and teach with regard to the church being taken out of the world prior to this great suffering that will come upon the people at the hands of the Antichrist. I don't believe that God warns us about his coming in 2 Thessalonians 2 and 1 John 2 and Matthew 24 and Revelation 13 for no reason. Like, if we're not going to be here, just why are you telling us to watch out for it, Lord? If we were going to be raptured out of the world prior to this coming upon God's people, why would God warn his people over and over and over again in his word, hey, church, suffering at the hands of this wicked ruler, it is coming, and it is coming upon the saints, and here's how you will recognize him, and here's how you will know that my coming is soon. He warns us about it and tells us his coming will be soon after it, It's not going to happen until this happens first, he says. He warns us about these things for the same reason that God warned his people about it in Daniel 8. Namely, to prepare us to endure it. And just as God comforted his people in Daniel's day by revealing that the persecution would be brought to an end and that the wicked ruler who oppressed them would be brought down, God comforts us by revealing That the Lord Jesus, the one who accomplished our salvation through his death and resurrection, will also secure our final deliverance from persecution, from suffering, from oppression, when he returns and slays the man of lawlessness with the breath of his mouth, bringing him to nothing by throwing this beast into the lake of fire that burns with fire and brimstone where the smoke of his torment will rise up day and night forever and ever. God prepares his people for suffering by warning them that it's coming. But he also comforts his people by promising our ultimate deliverance through Jesus Christ, his son. And for this work of grace, may God be praised and glorified and his people warned and comforted and prepared to love him well during our season of suffering. Let's pray together.